Amen. Thanks, Blair. Well, good morning, guys. Uh, does anyone here remember the show Mythbusters that used to air back in the day? Yeah, a couple people. Um, yeah, so it was basically this show where these two dudes would take famous scenes from movies and TV shows and kind of fact check it, you know, see if this was actually something that could happen uh, reasonably. Um, and the show was actually a pretty interesting watch. You know, it was cool to see these things that you kind of ex just accepted as truth um, be put to the test and, and see if they could have actually happened. So this morning we're going to do just that. We're going to do some myth busting of our own um, on this passage about the wise men. So a uh, couple questions, just who were these wise men? Were they really at Jesus' birth? And were they actually kings? So let's jump in. Myth number one, they rode camels. So not the most exciting one to start with, um, but you know we got to start somewhere. So um, you know, most depictions of the wise men show them making their way slowly and symbolically through the desert to get to baby Jesus um, via camel. But the reality is that um, people in northern Arabia typically only rode Arabian horses. So uh, it's very possible that the boys were actually galloping to get to baby Jesus as quickly as possible um, and make sure that they were actually there at the birth on time. Well, actually about that, myth number two, they were at the birth. Uh, you've seen it in every nativity scene, you know, every school play, but it's not true. Um, you know, while we actually don't know when they arrived for certain, um, people have kind of landed in, in two camps. One of them says 12 days. They were there 12 days after Jesus was born. That's why we have that song, 12 days of Christmas. Um, to, you know, some people say it was a whole two years after the birth, so they were, they were pretty late. Um, and it even says in the passage um, that when they arrived, they entered a house. And we do know that Jesus was not born in a house. Um, so it was some time after. And, um, you know, a fun fact about this one is that uh, Jenna's family really wanted to kind of instill this idea that the wise men weren't there um, from an early age in their family. So what they do is when they set up their nativity scene, they actually put the wise men like all the way across the room um, just to make sure that the kids knew that the wise men were not there. They were not going to be there anytime soon, uh, which I think is hilarious. So they would take them, all three of them, and move them over. Myth number three, how many wise men? Yeah, that's right. There's absolutely no evidence to suggest that there were actually three of these dudes. Um, you know, we know there were three gifts given to Jesus. And, you know, it probably wasn't one dude showing up, but uh, we, for all we know, Jesus could have had 10 wise men knocking on his door. And that's a lot of kings to be away from their kingdoms. Well, actually, mid number four, the wise men were kings. So we can certainly ascertain that the wise men were wealthy, you know, based on the, the gifts they gave. They were doing all right. Um, but again, there's no biblical evidence that any of these dudes were monarchs. Um, and so, alas, the song, We Three Kings, is ruined forever. All right, let me stop myself there before this turns into a roast of the wise men. That's not my intention uh, up here. But, you know, since we've talked a little bit about what the wise men weren't, um, let's transition and go into a time of talking about what the wise men were. Wise men, or magi. Um, wise men were influential and prominent political advisors. So it's speculated that they may have come from Babylon due to that being kind of the ancient center of astrology, but all we really know for certain is that they came from the East. And you know, just as we study experts and founders in our own fields, um, they could have studied the chief magi from 600 years prior, a guy named Daniel, um, who was a boy that received prophetic dreams from the Lord. One of which, um, you know, proposed a triumphal entry of the Christ. So, um, you know, all of Daniel's dreams and visions eventually came true, and the wise men, if they studied him, they would have known this, um, both from those studies and from the book of Daniel, um, which was actually, uh, you know, well-known and widely available at that time. Um, and since they were from the East, the wise men actually would have been the first Gentiles or non-Jews to worship Jesus, which is actually a really significant moment that could be seen kind of as like a shift heading into the New Testament around God's idea of chosen people um, and what that will look like in the future. And finally, they traveled far, um, not only bringing gifts for this child that they've never met, um, but trusting that he is who he says he is. Well, okay, he actually hadn't been born yet, so I guess he is who Herod says he is. And speaking of Herod, Surely the king would have showered them in riches and power had they just told him where Jesus was. And yet they elect to return home a different way 
to protect the young Jesus' life. And I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm starting to like these guys, just a little bit. At the end of the day, it isn't important what animal the wise men rode or um, you know, when they got to Bethlehem, but what matters most and the reason that I think the wise men are so relevant to the Advent season is because they were people of peace. And that's not to be confused with sons of peace from Luke 10 for all you missionaries out there. No, I'm, I'm talking about uh, how the wise men came to worship and they brought gifts. They brought gold, a precious metal. They brought frankincense, an expensive fragrance. And they brought myrrh. <laughs> what the heck is that? <laughs> myrrh was a costly perfume made from thorn bushes that was used as an anointing oil, so a very symbolic gift um, to give baby Jesus. But going back to the wise men themselves, you know, what is a person of peace? Well, I think it's only fair we start with the biblical definition of peace. Um, so in the Old Testament, peace came from the Hebrew word shalom, um, and in the New Testament, the Greek word of irene. The most basic meaning of these words is complete or whole. So shalom can be used in a number of ways. Um, you know, at the time, it could be used to refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and uh, no missing bricks. Um, shalom refers to something that's complex, you know, with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness or wholeness. It can also refer to a person's well-being, like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield and he asked about their shalom. And the core idea is that life is complex. It's full of moving parts and relationships and situations. When any of these are out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down and it needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or to restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment of their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. And this is true of human relationships as well. You know, the, the state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to bring, um, but as we know, that, that rarely happened. Um, which is why this passage in Isaiah was so exciting. Isaiah 9.6 for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Government uh, meaning dominion here. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. For this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. A king is coming, you know, one that is mighty and wonderful and forevermore. And among all these descriptors, prince of peace, prince of shalom, he will bring wholeness and restoration into our broken world. Shalom that only he can bring because it'll be shalom with no end. And this is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. You remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others, like when he said to his followers in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So the apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and with God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. So Romans puts it this way. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why the apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our peace um, in our arena, in Ephesians 2, 14 through 19. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he, may, he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. 
For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And this means as Jesus' followers, we are now called to create peace. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus who reconciled all things in heaven and earth. And all we have to do is trust in Jesus as the Son of God who came to save us, and we will have the peace or shalom of God. But this peace isn't just for us. It's for everybody. You know, people of peace shouldn't keep this good news just to themselves. We want others to know they could be restored through Jesus, whether they are near or whether they are far. And this is why I think the wise men are actually a great example of people of peace. You know, they came all that way. Um, they had hope that Jesus was who he said he was, and they came bearing gifts. And sure, you know, we don't have gold or frankincense, and let's be honest, most of us already forgot what myrrh is, but uh, we do have something even better, and that's the gift of the gospel. We want folks to hear how Jesus died for them. We want them to understand the weight of his sacrifice and the meaning of his resurrection. And finally, we want them to respond to the gift that's, that this prince of peace has restored relationship with them. And all they have to do is receive it. Um, something one of my mentors told me that will always stick with me is um, what Jesus did for us on the cross is the greatest act of love in history. And the only thing we can do that comes even close to that is tell people about it. And the unique thing um, about the gift of the gospel is that sharing it doesn't always have to look the same. You know, some people are ready to receive the good news as soon as they hear it, but um, for others, it, it takes time. And this is why we must continue to be people of peace to those around us, whether that person receives our gospel gift or they don't. Uh, William J. Toms, a man whose only other note on his Wikipedia page is that he created the word folklore, uh, so insert Taylor Swift joke here, uh, he had some wise thoughts on this. He said, be careful how you live, because you might be the only Bible someone ever reads. So as people sharing about Jesus, you know, our, our gospel gift shouldn't end with the last chapter of the gospel. You know, our, our actions should be constantly pointing people towards Jesus. Um, our ability to love, to forgive, and to actively listen. For some folks, they won't truly grasp the message of the gospel until they're surrounded by people of peace whose actions point them toward Jesus. And tonight, we have a tangible opportunity to do this. Uh, you know, as Josh shared, at 5 p.m., we're hosting a community holiday party here at Dwell. And there will be folks from the apartment upstairs and all around West Colfax in our building. And friends, what would it look like as a church to be people of peace tonight and to be the Bible to these folks? It's super easy to go to something like this and just sort of hang out with the people you know, but you know, what would it look like to listen to someone new, to hear their story, and to see them as Jesus does? Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So let's be peacemakers tonight, because we have good gifts to offer. As I mentioned earlier, King Herod would have absolutely had riches, fame, and power waiting, you know, had the wise men returned and told him where Jesus was. And it's significant that they didn't give up hope on this Prince of Peace, and they decided to return home a different way, even with the knowledge that, you know, he could have bribed them over with a lot of these tempting things. In fact, we see bribes all throughout Scripture. Um, perhaps most famously, we see it with Judas's betrayal of Jesus, but um, there's actually another significant moment uh, I wanted to share with you from Acts 24. Um, so at this time, the Apostle Paul had been arrested again, um, and he's being held by a man named Felix. So uh, Acts 24, 24 through 26. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness, and self-control in the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. And at the same time, he hoped that money would be given to him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. So despite being a prisoner here, Paul does what he does best. You know, he's a person of peace, and he offers the gift of the gospel with Felix. But you know, as we can see in the passage, Felix had other motives. You know, he hoped that 
in meeting with Paul, Paul would eventually offer him money to, to be released. So it says that Felix sent for Paul often. Well, the reality is Paul was uh, in prison here for two years. So they had two years worth of meetings where Paul shared the good news and Felix offered an easy way out, a bribe for his freedom. And all Paul had to do was stop sharing the gospel, offer up some money, and you know, an easier way forward was his. And my question for us is, how many of us have taken that bribe? Is there someone in your life you were at some point so determined to share the gospel with that you eventually gave up on? It could be a friend, a coworker, a family member. Because I know there are for me. Sometimes I took the bribe without even realizing. I stopped bringing up Jesus. I stopped being a person of peace. And I forgot the gospel myself. I have a buddy named Sam who I met uh, pretty early on in college. You know, we, we were best buds. We knew how to have fun together. So naturally, we became roommates. We spent a lot of time um, together. So at some point, I accepted Jesus, and I desperately wanted him to do so as well. So we talked, and I prayed, and I shared the gospel with him multiple times, and, and nothing. But I didn't give up hope. You know, I kept going until senior year, uh, where I invited him to the same retreat that I went to as a freshman and accepted Jesus a, a few years prior. So, um, you know, I had invited him to this thing every single year, but he never really took it seriously. But after being a person of peace in his life for all that time, you know, I could tell something was different. And he told me that he wanted to go. And I think I cried. <laughs> I couldn't wait for him to finally receive the gospel and give his life to the one who gives him life. This was March of 2020, and the trip was canceled the day before we were supposed to leave due to a global pandemic. So I must admit, I was crushed by this, so much so that I took the bribe the next couple years of our friendship. You know, I stopped bringing up Jesus. Um, I gave up hope that Sam would ever come to know him. And our conversations became surface level, and I forgot how deeply I wanted my friend Sam to know Christ. Well, that all changed on my wedding day. You know, as me and my boys were, were getting ready for the ceremony, my, my groomsmen, I asked them to, to pray over me. Um, and I didn't expect all of them to, but they did. They went one by one, they laid hands on me, and they prayed. Um, even Sam. And in my six years of knowing him, that was the first time I had ever heard him pray. pray. Um, and it was a beautiful, heartfelt prayer where he talked directly to Jesus. And I definitely cried that time. <laughs> um, that awoke something in me, made me remember how badly I wanted Sam to know the Lord and to be with me in heaven. Is Sam following Jesus today? No. But I've decided I will no longer be taking the bribe in that relationship. I will be a person of peace, bearing the gift of the gospel in that relationship. And I have hope that Sam will accept Jesus in time. And my encouragement to you guys is to do the same. Don't take the bribe. Instead, be a person of peace. Know that the gift that you bring is good and share it with all whom you encounter. Peace be with you in this Advent season. Uh, band, you guys can come on up, and I'm just going to pray for us as we transition to some worship.